الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم واصبر لحكم ربك فإنك بأعيننا وسبح بحمد ربك حين تقوم ومن الليل فسبحه وإدبار النجوم رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والله ما ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله والله ما جعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين uh, it's an honor to be back here again. It's been a long time since I had an opportunity to visit you. I pray that uh, this community remains healthy and safe and that Allah puts barakah in all of your rizq and protect you and your families. In today's khutbah, what I want to connect are two things that seem at first not connected to each other. And instead of telling you what this khutbah is about in the beginning, I'll begin to unfold that for you as we continue. And inshallah ta'ala, you'll see the point that is uh, that I'm attempting to make. So what I'm going to start with is something that Musa alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam have in common. In the story of Musa alayhi salam and in the story of Nuh alayhi salam, you see two visual elements, two things that seem to be in common with each other. One of them is the sea and the other one is the mountain. So in the story of Musa alayhi salam, we know that when Fir'aun was following him, Allah Azza wa Jal opened the sea, فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ He opened the sea for Musa alayhi salam and the Israelites and they went through and Fir'aun gets drowned inside of the sea. We also know that in the story of Nuh alayhi salam, it's the only other story where flood or drowning is the punishment given to the disbelieving nation and so the people who disbelieved in Nuh alayhi salam were drowned. In the beginning of the mission of Musa alayhi salam, Allah Azza wa Jal spoke to him on the mountain. The Arabic word for a mountain is either Jabal or Tur. Those are two words in the Quran used for the mountain. But regardless, Musa alayhi salam, Allah spoke to him on the mountain. And at the end of the journey of, or the, you know, when Allah commanded uh, Nuh alayhi salam to build his ship, to build the ark, uh, after the flood was over, was ala al-Judi, the ship landed on top of the mountain. So the two visual elements that these two stories have in common are the sea and the mountain. Now one more thing as we get closer to the point. Allah has a very unique style of speaking in the Quran. So when he speaks about different stories of the prophets, he speaks in unique ways about each of them. But sometimes he uses very similar language in one story 
and then you find the similar language again in a very different story. And something like that happens between Nuh alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam. So I want to start with Musa alayhi salam. When Musa alayhi salam went up to the mountain, Allah tells us in Surah Taha that when he went up to the mountain, Allah told him, not only is he about to give him the revelation, وَلَقَدْ مَنَنَّا عَلَيْكَ مَرَّةً أُخْرَى We had already done favors to you many times before this. We, we, Allah has been doing favors to Musa السلام, for a long time. And so he started reminding Musa السلام, when your mother put you in the basket, when your sister was walking on the side of the river, when you were raised in the house of Fir'aun, when, you, when we reunited you with your mother, so her eyes could become cool, so she could find comfort again. I did you the favor of reuniting you with your mother. Then you killed someone, and you escaped, and we tried you in many ways. And so there are all of these different trials that he went through. Allah makes a list of all of them, and then at the end of all of them, the part of the plan was he will get married in Madia and he will go in the desert and live there for a while. And then one time he will get lost in the desert and he will see a fire on top of a mountain. And he goes and tries to see what maybe he can get some directions there. This is where Allah was having this conversation with him. And he says to him some interesting things. He says, one of the things he says is, جِئْتَ عَلَىٰ قَدَرٍ يَا مُوسَىٰ You came here right on schedule. You came here exactly according to plan. So all the things you went through were part of my plan, so you could be here at this moment. But part of what Allah says, says to him also is, you know, li I have chosen you for myself. And another really beautiful thing, the thing I want you to focus on now, is he says, Wali ala aini. So you can be crafted and I'll focus on the word tusna'a in a second, you can be crafted under my watch. Meaning, crafting, you know when somebody works with wood and they make a table, and when somebody works with metal and they make a sword, and in, in different kinds of works, you have to do craftsmanship, you have to have art, artistry, you know, to cut the angles properly and to mold it properly. People do a lot of sunah when they are making a pot, or when they're making utensils, right? So Allah is describing someone being crafted or designed. So Allah is telling Musa السلام, that all of those experiences you had were part of you being designed. So you're, you know how in engineering there are stages of product development? And you have to go through one design phase, then the next design phase, then the next design phase. It's like Musa السلام's life was being engineered by Allah and every part of the design, every one of those experiences was part of the design, so you could be ready for your real mission. And in this, there's a really beautiful lesson that the experiences that we go through, they are part of Allah's design to, to help engineer us. Because we are like the human beings, are like, like a baby is like raw materials. Right? It's like raw materials. And as Allah puts us through these experiences, Actually, each one of those experiences starts building our understanding, builds our maturity, builds our experience. Sometimes you develop strength by going through pain, right? Like for, this is just Allah's design. You know, athletes, for example, if they want to improve themselves, they have to push harder than their previous stamina to improve. Right? And that's how they're being engineered to perform even better and better and better. So Allah says to him, وَلِتُصْنَعَ عَلَىٰ عَيْنِ So you can be crafted, engineered even, under my watch. And I want you to remember this phrase, crafted under my watch. Now, I told you the connection, there's some sort of a connection between Musa السلام, and Nuh السلام. And I told you about the mountain and the sea in the story of Musa السلام, and the mountain and the sea in the story of Nuh السلام. Then I told you that Musa السلام, Allah says to him, you will be craft, you were, you're, so you could be crafted under my watch. And then you find a similar phrase in the story of Nuh السلام. When you look at the story of Nuh السلام, and he, Allah told him to build this ship, which was a strange instruction because there was no water anywhere nearby. Why am I building a ship? And nobody even knows how to build a ship. Nobody, because they don't, they're not a people that live next to the sea, so they have no reason to know how to build a ship. So Allah gives him wahi and he says, وَاصْنَعِ الْفُلْكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا Engineer the ship under our watch. 
Musa alayhi salam was told, I engineered you under my watch. And Nuh alayhi salam is being told, engineer this ship under my watch. And so this phrase is similar between these two stories also. Now, what, let's focus on Nuh alayhi salam for a couple of moments. When he was being told to engineer the ship, then everyone around him, who already, they already called him crazy. They already insulted him for many generations. In fact, some of the things we learn in the Quran, the hints that we get, is that people used to disbelieve in Nuh alayhi salam, and then they would get married. Young men disbelieved in him, young men and women. They got married, they have children. They bring their children and say, don't listen to this crazy old man. And then the, those children get older, they get married, they have children, they bring their children and say, my dad told me, don't listen to this crazy old man. So generations and generations used to insult Nuh alayhi salam. But now, after 950 years, Allah is telling him, build a ship. And they're looking at him building a ship, and this is the, we told you he's crazy. This is, see? This is the craziest thing he's ever done. Right? So, one of the, the, the big allegations against Nuh alayhi salam is that he is insane. By the way, that same accusation was made against Musa alayhi salam also. He was called insane also. But anyway, so he's building this, this, this ark, this ship, under the watch of Allah. But while he is building it, the more he builds it, the more people make fun of him. The more, every day he's working on it. You cannot build the ship in one day. You cannot engineer it in one day. You're working on it, working on it, working on it. And Allah is, is it's almost as if, you know, when you, when you design something, when you, especially construction project, engineering project, and we know it's big enough that it's going to fit human beings, it's also going to fit animals. So it's a very large construction project, right? So you have to have blueprints, and you have to have a schematic, so you can put the right pieces in the right place, and you have to have structural engineering even. All of this has to be taken care of. Allah says, وَحَمَلْنَاهُ عَلَى ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَالدُّسُورِ In another place He says, we made, we boarded, them, boarded him onto something made up of boards of wood, planks of wood, and nails. It's as if every board of wood and every nail was designed by Allah, put this here, put this here, put this here. So everybody else is calling him crazy, but he's working according to the design Allah has revealed to him. You know, and he's, he's designing this ship. Now why did I mention both of these things to you? Now I, I slowly work towards the point that I wanted to share with you in this khutbah. There's a really beautiful surah in the Qur'an that I came here to, uh, to not only study but share some lessons from uh, with a, a group of uh, our students, uh, Surah At-Tur. Surah At-Tur is surah number 52 in the Qur'an. And I'd like you to go after the khutbah this weekend, just read Surah At-Tur on your own. In the beginning of Surah At-Tur, Allah takes a number of oaths. He swears by a number of things. The first thing he swears by is the mountain. And the last thing he swears by is the sea. So, وَالطُّور وَكِتَابِ المستور فِي رَقِّ المنشور وَالْبَيْتِ المعمور وَالْبَحْرِ المسجور. Actually, وَالسَّقْفِ المرفوع وَالْبَحْرِ المسجور. So the first thing was the mountain and the last thing was the sea. And it's very subtle and delicate that at the end of this surah, Allah talked to His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah talked to Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And He said to him, وَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا Keep moving forward with patience, stay strong on your mission, because you are commanded by, the, by your Rabb, because of the hukum of your Rabb, stay, keep working forward, because you are definitely under our eyes. The same phrase that I told you was used in the story of Musa alayhi salam. The same phrase that was used in the story of Nuh alayhi salam is a similar phrase that now Allah is using for Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. And he's using it in Surah At-Tur, in the beginning of which he made a hint towards the mountain and he made a hint towards the sea. But what does it mean for our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam? It actually, it's kind of a combination of both of those stories and then even more. In the sense that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is going to go through many, many experiences while he is in Mecca. 
And every one of those experiences is part of what Allah wants him to go through, not just for him, but actually the, 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 the lessons for all of the ummah until judgment day are being designed by the experiences that our Prophet is going through Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we contemplate that for a little bit, that's a very powerful lesson. What is that lesson? Every surah of the Qur'an that we recite so beautifully, our Qur'an memorize them and we enjoy them reciting them in the prayer. When those surahs were given to the Prophet ﷺ, when he would recite them, people would call him crazy. People would insult him. And he had to go through those experiences so that a, a thousand and a half years later, you and I can recite those same surahs. You understand? So he, Allah put him through that because actually he had to go through that so one day we can value what we're reciting. So one of the things that every Muslim, myself and yourself should be aware of is the words of Allah that we get to recite, they're not cheap. It was a big sacrifice that had to be made and the Rasul was being crafted and his mission was being designed by Allah with a lot of pain so that one day we can have the convenience of having access to the word of Allah. Because it did not come to us in an easy way. It came through us to the sacri through the sacrifices of our Messenger وسلم, and those that believed in him. The other thing is that in both of those stories, especially in the story of Nuh السلام, Allah Azza wa told Nuh السلام, to build this ship. But why was he telling him to build the ship? Because the adab of Allah is very close. The adab of Allah is very close. So two things are getting closer. Two things are increasing. One, the, 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 the time they have left and the state of emergency is increasing. Two, the way they make fun of him is also increasing. And as the Prophet ﷺ was making his da'wah and he was sharing the Qur'an with the people of Mecca, their aggressiveness towards him was also increasing. And the more their aggressiveness was increasing, the time for hijrah was also coming closer and closer. The time to leave Mecca was coming closer and closer. When he has to leave Mecca, the moment he will leave Mecca, the, the, the new chapter will begin. And that new chapter is not just the life in Medina, it's the chapter of adab, punishment for the people of Mecca. And the first episode of that punishment was Badr. The second episode was Uhud and so on and so forth. Right? The punishment, will, the, the phase of da'wah is over, now Allah's punishments will begin for them. Nuh السلام, has to build the ark and soon after that the punishment of Allah will come. So Rasul وسلم, is being told, you stay on your mission, we're watching, we're watching. فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا But there's a subtle difference, there's a really interesting small difference. And there's a beautiful connection also between the building of the ark and what the Prophet ﷺ was given when Allah says, فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا Nuh ﷺ was told to build the ark, وَاسْنَعِ الْفُلْكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا It also suggested that we will watch over every single nail, every single piece of wood. We will control every part of this design. And Rasulullah ﷺ is being told, وَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا Stay committed to your mission, no matter what people are saying to you, no matter how much they call you crazy, whatever insults they give you. Keep moving forward, don't back down, because every step you take is being designed by us. Every single step you take is being designed by us. So don't think these people have control. Don't think these people can cause any failure. They cannot cause anything. You just keep doing what you're doing. Your mission is this. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. So it's almost like when Rasul Sallallahu is thinking about the work that he's doing, he can't help but make the connection between what Nuh Alayhi Salaam was doing as he was building the ark. But the problem with that was, the more you build the ark, the closer you get towards the punishment. The closer you, the, the people of Nuh are getting towards punishment. And the more Rasulullah is giving da'wah, the closer his people are getting towards the punishment. Things are about to change. Things are about to change. And so beautifully, what Allah does in this, in, in this surah, He tells the Prophet والسلام, to make tasbih. He, he tells him, it seems like it's unrelated. 
فإنك بأعيننا وسبح بحمد ربك حين تقوم ومن الليل فسبحه وإدبار النجوم As you get to the end of the surah, the Prophet ﷺ is being told, keep doing tasbih of Allah until idbar al-nujum. Meaning, do tasbih of Allah in the night time also, until the stars begin to disappear. Meaning, fajr time. Yeah? And this is a very important image, because the image of doing tasbih of Allah in the night is actually like his mission. He is calling to Allah, describing the perfection of Allah, sharing the word of Allah, and around him is the darkness of kufr, darkness of shirk, like the darkness of the night. And soon that situation is about to change. There's going to be a new morning that's coming. A new light is going to emerge out of Medina. A new situation is going to arise. And to prepare for that mentally, the Prophet ﷺ is being told, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَسَبِّحْهُ وَإِدْبَارَ النُّجُومِ Declare Allah's perfection until the coming of the morning. Until the, the disappearance of the stars, meaning there's new light that's coming. Right? So in it there's a subtle hint that things are about to change until the hukum of Allah comes. Until then you keep doing this. وَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ Until then you keep working. But soon I will give you a new hukum, a new rule, and that rule will be to make hijrah. And you'll have to go. So in the last part of this khutbah, I wanted to share with you what this means for you and me. These are just some connections that I wanted to show you how beautifully and very delicately there are connections made in the Qur'an between things. But what does that mean for you and me? You see, the Prophet ﷺ is being told that sometimes when you, do, and through him we're learning, when you do the right thing, when you follow the command of Allah, when you stand by the truth, when you stand by what is just, when you don't allow corruption to happen under your watch, when you call it out, whenever you do that, it requires sabr. Because whenever you say the truth, somebody gets angry. If you say the truth to your mother, she'll get angry. If you say the truth to your wife, don't try this at home, she'll get angry. If you tell the truth to your brother, he might get angry. There's a truth inside you, there, something wrong has happened. If you speak the truth in the family, sometimes if you speak the truth in your department, the manager might get angry. If you speak the truth in court, some politician might get angry. You know, they, whenever people stand by the right thing, then people get offended. You're afraid to get attacked when you do the right thing. And so what did the Prophet ﷺ get told? وَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ This is sabr actually. Sabr is, I'm gonna stand by the right thing no matter what happens. No matter what, no matter what people say, no matter how much they attack me. In fact, in this surah right before this, أَمْ يُرِيدُونَ كَيْدًا are they planning, are they scheming, are they making a plan to hurt the Prophet in some way? Is that what they're planning? Let them plan. You just do what your Rabb told you. You keep doing that. But when you do that, it's scary. It's scary. And so what Allah tells His Prophet ﷺ is that yes, they will attack, they will insult, they will even... By the way, they did try to kill the Prophet, didn't they? Before he could leave Mecca. They tried to kill him, alayhi salatu wasalam. So it will get more and more serious. But just know, even when they're trying to kill you, you are under our eye. Allah is watching. And this being under the eye of Allah is actually a very loving phrase. It's a phrase of, it's not just, oh, we're, we're watching you, like, you know, like a security camera watching. It's not like that. It's, it's much more loving than that. Like a, a mother who takes her child out, and she's a, a little baby, two, three years old, is walking a little bit. And the mother, every two, three seconds, she's checking if he's still there. If, or if he, hold, if he lets go of her hand for a quick second, she immediately gets it again. Because she, keeps, she needs to keep an eye on the baby every second. This is bi'ayuniha, it's under her eyes. Or bi'aynayha, under her eyes. And so when the Prophet ﷺ is being told Allah is watching, Allah is telling him, you're never alone. When you think they have, there are so many of them and there's so few of the followers, they have so much power, I have nothing. No, you have Allah with you. So you wasbir li hukmi rabbik fa innaka bi'ayunina. What that means for you and me again is, we've gotta be strong. And we've gotta, we've gotta keep doing the right thing until it becomes impossible to do the right thing. Until the very moment it becomes impossible. And when it becomes impossible, Allah will open a new door. 
Because Allah, that's His promise in other places in the Quran too. وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will make a new way out for them. A new exit, a new possibility. This is similar to the dua the Prophet ﷺ was told to make. رَبِّ أَدْخِلْنِي مُدْخَلَ صِدْقٍ وَأَخْرِجْنِي مُخْرَجَ صِدْقٍ You know, when you, when you bring me into a situation, bring me with truth. And if you get me out of a situation, get me out because of truth. You know, and it, it's a loaded phrase, but the, the fundamental idea is the same. The idea is you and I cannot just say, we stand up for justice without going through pain. You have to go through pain. Allah loved His Prophet ﷺ so much, and He allowed him to go through a lot of pain. And that's an important lesson. Sabr means you have to go through pain. And when we are ready to go through that pain, then like Nuh alayhi salam, like Musa alayhi salam, and finally like even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, we are going to be under the eye of Allah. Allah is going to be watching. And He is going to, and how will you find this? When will Allah give a new way for you? How will Allah make a new you know, opening for you? Well, the secret is given in the surah, isn't it? Sabbih bihamdi rabbika hina taqoom. Wa min al-layli fasabbihu wa idbar al-nujum. Do tasbih of Allah every time you get up. Just remember Allah in every activity. Hina taqoom means basically any activity. Everything you're about to do, remember Allah first. Ya Allah, I know you're watching. Ya Allah, I know you're perfect. Do that first, and then do whatever job you're about to do. And then even at night time, when all your activities are done, then get up in the middle of the night, and then declare Allah's perfection again, until the stars disappear. We connect ourselves to Allah, and Allah guarantees He will bring a new situation. But it's not just dua to Allah, it's sabr, standing up for the truth, and dua to Allah. And so this is what I want to conclude with. Some people, they have this wrong idea, Ustad, I made so much dua to Allah, Allah is not changing anything. I keep making dua, I keep making dua, but nothing is changing. Right, but the only problem with that is you're making dua, but you don't have any sabr. And sabr doesn't mean that you sit there and let the situation happen. Then I ask sometimes, what is not changing? Well, my father, he gets really angry, and I make so much dua that Allah makes him a happy person, and he stops being an angry person, but that's not happening. Well, dua, the purpose of dua is not to change another human being, but maybe you should have some sabr, which also means you should ta talk to your dad about his anger problem. Oh, no, 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 I can't do that. Well, then don't st stop making dua then. <laughs> because you don't have the sabr, that, because sabr requires you have to speak the truth. Sabr requires you have to confront the situation, and then with that is tasbih, with that is dua. Those two things go hand in hand. You can't just not do anything, and then just say, I'm making dua, nothing is changing. You see? So this powerful lesson is being given to the Prophet ﷺ. He wasn't just told, do tasbih, Allah will get rid of your enemies. No, wasbir li hukmi rabbika. Wasabih. Have sabr against the things they're saying, still face them, still share the truth with them, be insulted by them, even deal with their attacks, all of that will happen, but at the same time keep doing tasbih. This is the mentality I have to develop. This is the thought process I have to develop. This is the thought process Nuh alayhi salam was given, this is the, thought, the mentality Musa alayhi salam was given, and it was finally in its perfected form given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. May Allah azza wa jal guide our actions and our thoughts and our emotions through His beautiful words, and may Allah azza wa jal bring the blessings of the Qur'an into my life and yours. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إنك لا تخلف إن الله لا يخلف الميعاد 
ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا مقوتا